Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now, here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Welcome. This is the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Your host, Joey, the Italian Stallion Murray, joined as always by Russ, the Idea Guy Morgan. So, Russ, last week was a bit of a divide and conquer type of week. Would you agree? Well, I know up here I didn't see you, so <laughs> I, I guess we divided and I was conquering. Oh. What, what were you doing? Dude, you have no idea how I conquer. Okay, let's hear it. Okay, nine days, me, my six-year-old, my four-year-old, and my seven-month-old. Dad, solo. Snap. For nine days. All right, how'd, how'd you handle that? I'm going to go ahead and say this. So first things first, mom and my two older daughters are on the plane on their history tour. And what's the first order of business? We got to sit down. We got to come up with a plan. Okay. So I'm like, Adler, Chapel, what do you want to make sure we cover? They're coming up with all sorts of stuff. I mean, they want to go to Let's Play. They want to go on a picnic. They want to watch sunsets. And they want to go to a daddy dinner fancy date. Fancy date. You know the fancy date. Okay, like Reba McIntyre fancy or? No, not that fancy. Okay. (laughs) I'm talking they want an excuse to get in their daddy-daughter day dresses. Okay. They got the sparkliest silver dress with the lace and the bedazzled stuff all hanging off of it. So they're princesses. Oh, yeah, 100%. So I get the baby dressed up in her little Cinderella costume. Okay. And then my four-year-old, six-year-old have their stuff with the sparkly shoes. And that, of course, I'm doing their hair, which. What, what do you say? Do you say you're doing the hair? I, okay. I attempted. Okay. It was up. It was out of their face, at least. It wasn't pretty. I mean, what was this like? A Did you do some YouTube on this? Like to come up with like Man, some sort of. No. Do or? Come on. Come on. I've watched my wife enough. I just, I yeah. just slapped it all together and tied it off a little bit. And, <laughs> you know, they didn't. This does not sound good. <laughs> they didn't cry and it was good. So we go, we get their, their little steak. I'm cutting it up. Wait, they, your, your daughters, your six and four year old are eating steak? Oh yeah, we go to the Firebird Steakhouse, man. Like this is a special deal. This is, in fact, my, my six year old said, dad, is this, um, is this fancy? In fact, I tried to get us to go somewhere else. And she said, is, have, have they changed it since we were there last? <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? She said, that wasn't very fancy. So I couldn't get away with like, the neighborhood restaurant. Gotcha. Like, I had to go. Fancy oh, place. you were trying to take her somewhere else. And she's like, no, yeah. that, that place didn't qualify. Yeah. She's like, last time it wasn't very fancy. Have they changed it? Uh. <laughs> so I got called out. Anyway, long story short, they had a blast. We all sat down. We took pictures of each other. They wanted, they saw the sunset coming down in the, in the window there at the restaurant. And they just thought this was the best. So you were solo dad for nine days. All right, you got to transition. How does that apply to our podcast today? Well, I don't know if it's on the same level, okay? But Nicole Stoller is our guest today. Nicole is what she would say the self-proclaimed W-2 entrepreneur. Okay. And you know as well as I do, on this show, we've kind of talked about those things kind of being pitted against each other. Being a W-2 employee or being an entrepreneur And I think what was so refreshing about what Nicole brought to the table here is how those two things can live side by side. Okay. Give me an example of what you thought uh, tied your story and Nicole's together. Well, here she is. She's dividing concrete. She's doing her job, which she loves. She's a a technology consultant and she loves what she's doing. She said there's all these other benefits that come with being an employee, but at the same time, simultaneously, she has been starting a real estate um, company. Her husband's helping to run that on the side to help lower their risk of job loss, to increase passive income, and to do these things will give her more freedom ultimately. Uh, I see what you've done here. You've pulled the divine conquer with Nicole and her husband running a real estate business and her running a a more traditional uh, employee role. 
to your wife being on a trip and you at home uh, messing up your kid's hair and taking them on a, a fancy dinner date. Yeah, yeah, sounds about right. All right, I love it. All right, well, let's dive into this interview. Hopefully, you'll love Nicole's interview as much as you did hearing about Joey and his three girls. Now, Nicole stole it. If you've been listening to our show for a while and you've heard the stallion and I talk about how we use these life insurance policies to invest in our business, to buy real estate and to do numerous other things. And you're like, look, I want to do that. That's what I want to have. But I don't have one of these policies is so stinking easy. Just go into the show notes, press the button to schedule a call with us. Somebody on our team can walk you through that process or go to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com. Click the schedule a call now. Welcome to the show. We have Nicole Stoller joining us today. Nicole, thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Joey. I'm excited. Nicole, we, we're really interested in your story for many reasons, and I, I want to dive into the nuts and bolts, but there, there's a starting point to everything. And it, it's funny that as I kind of was doing a little research and listening to kind of your background, it all started in 2010 to some degree, sitting in a typical financial planner's office, what we like to refer to as Willie Wall Street. Tell us a little bit about that conversation. Sure. Uh, basically, if you think about the financial planning industry and you're, you're driving toward retirement, you're driving toward what's going to happen at 65. And my financial planner was basically looking at the different scenarios. And you can do this online too, right? You, you calculate how much you have today. You calculate how much you're adding a year. And the financial planner says, okay, you know, if the market performs really well, we might be looking at 7% per year in growth. Or if it performs terribly and we have bumps along the way, it might be 3%, right? There's these variables. And then the end of the variables would also be, well, then how much can you withdraw at 65 or whatever age it is? And for me, the delta was between, and I'll just say the numbers, it was between, hey, you're doing pretty well, assuming all these factors, assuming the market performs, you, you need about three million. Assuming things are terrible and we take the most conservative approach, you need five million. And to get to five million, you need to put X amount more in per year. And it was kind of eye-opening to me that that was a huge gap a big delta, a, an uh, impact on my lifestyle, right? To put incrementally more in per year and just a lack of control over those variables and how much extra money I might need to be able to retire at, you know, 65 plus. So Nicole, you're sitting there and he drops that big $5 million number in your lap. Like what's going through your mind at that point? Well, it, it's a huge number, right? And, and you're thinking to yourself, what? I have no control over this. This is the biggest thing that, that really hit me is I have zero control over this. And the flip side of it is you don't want to live this life where you're, you're scrimping to mm. get to X amount per year. Then you get there and then maybe you didn't need all that, right? You gave up trips with friends. You didn't go out to dinners, you know? So there's this balance. And I just felt like uh, it was kind of ridiculous, the, the, the delta. I mean, it's the gap. But by, by the way, did he, did the advisor tell you how long you would live? <laughs> yes. Because then it would be easy. Then you could really plan ahead and just know exactly how long it needs to last. I mean, that'd be helpful to know, right? It's such a great point. <laughs> well, that, there's so many assumptions that have to be made in that. And, and Joey and I kind of poke fun at that concept. And it really, I, I think because I, I participated in that from 2004 to 2009, that's what I did. I sat down and had those same exact conversations. I don't know if he, if he gave you one of these like three, um, three inch binders that you could take home with all the numbers so that you really could like let that set in of how little money that you needed to spend over the next, you know, 35 years so that you could maybe potentially, hopefully uh, have that amount of money uh, last for you in the future. But that was what I would do to go and be like, Oh, here you go. And by the way, uh, save 110% of what you're making right now. Cause you know, we, we're, 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 we're 10 years in and we, we really, uh, we're, we're off to a bad start. We're way behind. <laughs> yeah. So Nicole, it doesn't sound like you walked out of there really excited about uh, this information. Was there something at that point that kind of motivated you 
to do something different? Yes. So we, so way back in 1999, my husband and I had read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and we invested in real estate. And then my husband got into property management. So there was a, a, a lot of pieces there, but, and we had some small real estate investments, but we weren't, that was not a huge focus for us for a number of years in between those time frames. And really what we did after that call and that meeting was accelerate our real estate investment because we felt like, okay, you know what? We know how to do this. We know how to prudently run real estate investing as a business. Let's ramp this up because that is something that we can control. And we just put a lot more focus into that than we had for, for about a five-year period. So, so you immediately just quit your job and focused <laughs> on real estate, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, so that, just being clear, just being clear. Yes, yes. So a couple of things. I love my job. There is, a, and I know, you know, people maybe don't love their job or do, but if you love your job, it's okay. I, I think you're, you're in a great position where you've got W-2 income. It's, it gives you health benefits, right? And, and access to, you know, some resources that you wouldn't get as an entrepreneur. And yet then I partnered essentially with my husband who he quit his full-time job and ran our real estate business. So that's, that's the way we approach it. So speak a little bit to that because there's listeners right now that are kind of in that, in, in that position where they love their job and they've got great income, but they, they don't love the idea of being out of control investing. So we have this kind of what we call the hierarchy of wealth. And at the very top of it, is speculation that's the thing with no control no influence no collateral right uh, no no uh, hope to get the money back you know it's a great money machine for Willie wall street but not great for us and so people are saying i don't want to be putting my money into that world but i don't know how to get into something else so I explain like for that person like how you having a, a consistent you know and and uh, when you say W-2, some people know what that means, but other, basically you're working for a corporation of some sort. Um, how was having that income beneficial to you? Well, the first level is, and, and there's a lot of different ways that if we're talking about real estate specifically, there's obviously a lot of different ways you can invest. In some ways, you are not qualifying for a mortgage. In other ways, you are and you would be. And when you have a W-2 income that with verified pay stubs with, you know, multiple years of um, your, your W-4, with all of those things, you basically, are, it is easier to get mortgage loans that you can then use to build leverage into real estate investments. So having that is a huge benefit. I, I, I think health benefits are a huge piece as well uh, uh, for being employed and then not having to worry about, those are uh, some pretty high costs if you're going out and getting health benefits on your own. So, so I, I'm going to go ahead and throw this um, out there to you, Nicole. You've actually coined this term, so I'm not, I'm gonna, I'm not bringing this up myself. You called it the W-2 entrepreneur, and I think there's so much... Um, excitement around that in my mind, because there are people that do like what they're doing. And, and forgive us in the past, sometimes we've poo-pooed the idea of, you know, how can I get out of my job? How can I get out of my job? But that's not always the case. And it, you don't need to feel shame. Like if you're listening to this, you're like, man, I really like this. So, but how do I then expand beyond this? So the W2 entrepreneur, I love that term. So what would you say are some of the skills? Somebody is in that position right now, that they need to be picking up, they need to be learning in order to get to this point that you're talking about? I'll speak from real estate. I obviously, uh, I have a podcast myself that is focused on folks that are working full time that are doing something to generate incremental wealth. So I, I don't think real estate is the be all end all. I mean, absolutely. There's people doing other things, owning franchises, building other types of businesses. But I personally really like real estate because there are very basic fundamentals. It, it, there's a lot of information available. It's how to analyze and make the right decisions around real estate. A lot of people are sharing lessons that they've learned. So I think that particular vehicle uh, lends itself well for being a W-2 entre 
entrepreneur. So understand if you have just one rental property, you are a W-2 entrepreneur. You have one property that is a business and you should treat it as such. It should be LLC. There's a lot of things that you should do around that, but that is a business. Um, so what I would say is educate yourself um, and network locally in person and find other people that are doing what you want to do and develop relationships with them. I, I actually host a real estate meetup locally in Scottsdale, Arizona for women who want to invest in real estate. And the sole purpose is let's connect people to, to people who want to you know, learn from others and share experiences. And you'll find groups like that all over the country, right? That aren't trying to sell you anything that are really trying to provide value. And I would start with that kind of education. So, so two, two, hold on, hold on, Stallion. Let oh, me get oh, a question whoa. in here. All Sometimes right, this right. guy just railroads me to cold. will not ever <laughs> let me in. I feel like I'm just the second fiddle here. So two things. One, I do want to, uh, for all those listening, especially those who work uh, for Joey and I, we know how much you love your job. We want you to continue to work for us. Um, it, is, it is okay to not be a business owner. Thank you. Thank <laughs> right. you for clearing uh, pride. So here, here's a question that came to my mind, though. Like you talked about networking. I'm thinking about the person, though, who's behind the scenes, who is not necessarily out in front. And I know your career, you're kind of in, in sales and tech sales specifically. And so you, you love getting out and meeting people just the same way we do. How big of a skill set, though, is it for someone to network if they don't have it? So what, would, what advice would you give to somebody who maybe is a little more introverted into how do I get out there? How do I you know, go meet people? Because we do believe you know, your net worth is in your, in the people that you know, right? Your network. So how do, how do I gain that though? If I'm naturally inclined to be kind of more reserved behind the scenes, not kind of outward uh, focused. Okay. So maybe there's different levels. That's a, it's a, such a great question. I was, if you, if you can, I would encourage you to go to a couple of meetups because you, you need to see maybe one isn't providing the value that you would like. So you, you go to a couple of meetups and you ask the host to have a separate, you know, go grab coffee, get some one-on-one -on -one time with, with them. I would imagine as an introvert, you don't want to be speaking up in front of the group of people. You don't want to be asking questions then that's totally fine. The, the reason the host is hosting that meetup is, is to connect people. So they should be very open to doing that. So that would be one thought I have. Um, another thought would be doing a little bit of research in your market. And if you can even just Google, if you uh, Google uh, real estate investing and your location, you might see different articles and different people that come up. I would look for a investor friendly realtor. This is another person that is going to want to meet with you and going to want to create connections and should be well connected because if they're catering to the investor market, they, they need to have those connections. Um, I will tell you here locally in Arizona, there is a lady at a title company that she focuses on investors and giving them resources and she's a connector. She would be someone to reach out to, go have coffee with and ask who should I meet with to learn about X, Y, and Z? So you can you can kind of get into a one-on-one -on -one with maybe those three three routes. Uh, you know, looking you know the meetup, looking online, maybe finding you know calling around it. Well, maybe you don't want to call around finding title companies. Um, I, I would say those would be all ways to kind of get into smaller smaller in person. So. That's, that's really helpful. Um, what about, you mentioned Rich Dad Poor Dad as a book that kind of sparked your interest in real estate to begin with. What other resources or, um, you know, things that you can refer or recommend to people as they're starting this kind of a W-2 entrepreneur journey? Specific to real estate, I would also recommend the website biggerpockets.com. The, I did write an article actually though about bigger pockets. I don't, you, you shouldn't just go there and start reading everything because the real estate industry has a lot of different niches and it is very easy to get overwhelmed by all of these different approaches. So I, I always advocate first that you should understand 
your overall goals and what you're trying to accomplish. What'll, and then you, you need to ask some questions about, you know, where do you live? How much time do you have? And as you go through these questions, it'll help you determine, okay, you know what, I don't have enough time to manage a property myself, or I live in a high cost of living area. It's not going to be feasible to buy a house, you know, in, in my location. So I need to find someone in another area or I need to research other states. So there's a, a set of questions that I would say you should probably go through first before you spend time on bigger pockets. But once you know what you're looking for, then take that targeted search and you can find information there. Well, we keep asking questions and I know your niche is in that real estate space and you touched on it briefly. You had, you and your husband jumped in the real estate without knowing a whole lot about what you were doing which by the way, Joey and I have done the same thing in our past. And I've shared uh, those, those sob stories many times on here, but there's some that are, are thinking, okay, I keep hearing real estate. This is the route I should go. I know nothing about it, um, but now here's an expert. Here's somebody who, uh, with your background, you're not only in the single family space, you're in the multifamily space. You guys are focusing on uh, doing hotel syndications. I mean, you, you've kind of branched out to a much broader uh, market, but when somebody comes up to you, you're on the road and they say, Nicole, I've heard your podcast, Richard Geek. I, I've heard how you and your husband, Mike, have built kind of a, a real estate portfolio that's pretty amazing. I've never done it though. Like what are some of those outside of going to a couple of events, reading a couple of books, what are some other things that you would tell us to do first so that we don't make some of the same mistakes that Joey made whenever he started? Oh, so it's going to be me now. Okay. I, all right. I, I would love to hear about your mistakes. I will tell you our mistakes were a hundred percent not knowing how to manage and operationalize uh, that side of the, the business. Uh, the, the piece we were pretty good at was finding good deals. So that, that part's, you know, finding a property is one thing and there's an art to that as well. Uh, oh gosh. So to your question, and I, I do get this, I get a lot of questions from people and they also are a little overwhelmed and they don't know exactly where to start. Um, I do think just look where you are right now and what you're trying to, what you're trying to do at this point in your life. So as an example, you have kids going to college. Uh, where, where are they maybe thinking of going to college? I, I met with one guy that basically ended up buying a house close to the university where his son was going to go. And then he rented out the other rooms to other college students. And essentially the entire mortgage was paid and then his son kind of lived quote unquote rent free. So that's a great strategy where he is and his life and what's happening. I also met with someone who said, I, uh, we, we have a small growing family. We need to move to a bigger house. And I said, well, look at the house you already own. What can you do with that? It, it, will it rent and have a good cash flow? Uh, if you don't want to manage it yourself, would you put property management in place? Does the numbers still work? Do you want to turn it into a short-term rental? Is it in an area where a lot of people are traveling and there's tourism? So you can start at a, I would say, you know, at a, at a basic level, if you want to own the property yourself with a single family home, if you want to passively invest, that's a whole other side of things, invest into commercial larger types of properties and in that case, you just really need to know what are the percentages, what is it you expect, how long are you able to uh, put your cash into that investment, and are you willing to, to let it be there for that entire time frame? Are you confident in the people that are going to be running the investment? There's a number of factors there. So, Yeah. So, Nicole, I, just to back up a second, the whole idea of buying a house for your college-age kids to live in, does that work with four-year-olds as well? Um, I mean, I just, on certain well, days, my four-year-old would be great to be a tenant in someone else's house. And I'm just, just trying to see, to, my ears are open. Um, no. So I, I actually have a serious question. Um, so you mentioned, I, I want to kind of play devil's advocate. So someone's listening to this, they say, man, it sounds great, Nicole. I mean, it sounds awesome. So it sounds so easy to have a W-2 job and then to start investing on the side and create uh, rental real estate uh, income, whatever. So what about the person that's saying, okay, 
how do you find time? I mean, my job is already, um, you know, it's already demanding. How did you, how did you break through that barrier personally? And what were some tips for them? That is such a great question. And, and I would say it is not necessarily easy. <laughs> it isn't easy. Uh, and, I, and I wouldn't advocate for that, but I would say it's worth it. Right. And so it's kind of maybe two different approaches. But in terms of finding the time, it, a lot of different things here. You could absolutely put property management in place. Now, please don't, don't think that you put a property management in in there and then you just walk away and you just get checks in the mail. You don't get to be completely passive like that unless you're investing in a passive investment. You will have to manage your manager. So you will need to make sure that they're adhering to your wishes. Even if you have a contract, you're going to have to do that. So just know that you can't completely walk away, but what will they take off of you? They'll take off phone calls in the middle of the night, they'll handle repairs, right? So you, if you don't wanna deal with that, that's what property management can do. You do want to deal with that. If you want to self-manage, you can, you can really put some systems in place and also train your residents. So there's different strategies around that. You can, and we'll just talk like on a, on a technology side, some mm -hmm. systems that you can put in place. So you would basically, you can use phone services where you're still carrying around your cell phone, but if you're getting a text or you're calling back to your, your resident, your phone number is masked. So they don't, they don't have your personal number, but you're still able to call them, right? So there's things like that. You can also put processes in place around when they want to request, when they have a maintenance issue, a lot of different things like that you can do if you want to do that on your own or hire property management. Well, you mentioned something that I thought was really interesting. And, and Joey, you could take some notes from this for, for your four-year-olds. You, you said <laughs> training your residents. Give, give me just like a, a, a small peek into what does that look like? Well, some of the things that we do in our single family not so much in multi, so multifamily is different because you have, you know, an apartment complex, we get, typically have an on-site person, that's sort of a different scenario. But in single family properties, one of the things we do is we put a lease in place that basically is, there's an extra, let's say the lease is $1,500 a month. We will actually say, if you don't call us for nuisance types of things, your rent will give you a $100 credit. So your rent is $1,400 a month. Now you just build that in, obviously mm -hmm. you put the yeah. rent where, but the nuisance is the clogged drain, the leaky faucet. Th those are the things that we try to train our residents that, you know, hey, you t can you take care of that yourself? Now we're gonna make sure that the property is clean, it's safe, that the, all the major systems are working very well, right? Obviously, if you have an HVAC, we live in Arizona, you have an air conditioning <laughs> problem, you call us, right? Absolutely. Um, but the other thing is, is we, you have vetted, um, vetted contractors that you work with, you know and trust those people, these things you build up over time. But I would say that the nuisance is the piece that people struggle with, those constant, you know, calls. And some residents can be high maintenance. So it's a way to, to train them. No, that's that's awesome. What great tips there, Joey. Yeah, uh, that's Apply you. that. See, see if you can get Adler to fix the leaky <laughs> sink. This is amazing. This is a skill set she learns and she can apply later on in life and it knocks a hundred dollars off her rent. I feel Absolutely. like right now, this is kind of sidebar, but um, I feel like my wife is training me or tracking me one of the two. I just, I'm sitting in my car, Nicole, uh, as we're at the lake uh, having this conversation. I just found like this little tile in my car and I was like, what is that? Oh yeah, that's one of those things that tells you where you are. So my wife is like keeping up with me. Maybe that's why she's training me. <laughs> All right. So anyway, sorry, sorry about that uh, sidebar there. So this is like really, really great information. I want to dive a little bit deeper though, into what you and Mike are doing with your business, because you guys have kind of created a space for people who don't have time. Um, as Joey just went into that, Hey, I've got too much going on. I, I'm looking for a way to kind of partner with somebody. I'm looking for a way to get into real estate but I don't know where to start. You guys created a model for that person. Am I correct in what I've learned? Yes. So explain a little bit about that. 
there's, uh, there's two pieces to the model. We have uh, the hotel syndication and that particular model is a large commercial investment and the investors are passive, although they do have opportunity to you know, come tour the hotel, to you know, get monthly updates, understand what's going on, those types of things. Uh, that is completely passive and you know, very similar to apartment syndications, other types of things that you would see. Uh, the other model is around the single family homes and that's where someone actually wants to own the property. So the, so the difference is in the hotel, uh, my husband and I, we go out and secure the loan. It is, it is with, it, with our company and the investor is putting funds in and getting a return and equity on that investment, but they are not part of the loan and not participating in that way. But then if people are wanting to 100% own the home, there, that's the model that we're doing to kind of around turnkey single family homes. But we do that only in the Phoenix metro area because that's where our systems and our processes and our network is uh, that we can count on. Man, that's really cool. And I'm assuming all of that started out of people keep coming to you and saying, hey, what do you guys do and how do, you, how do I do something similar? And you said uh, there's an opportunity here for us to take our knowledge and know-how and, and partner with others. Is that where it came from? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's so cool. Well, Nicole, it's been amazing to have you on the show. You provided a great value. If somebody wanted to connect with you um, and, and learn more about what you guys are doing, how could they do that? The best way is on my podcast website, which is the richer, R-I-C-H-E-R, geek.com. That is so cool. Well, thank hey, you so much. Way, hey, don't forget this, Russ. So Nicole has graciously agreed to be a part of our community. And uh, we'll be doing a live Q&A just in a few days. And so if you are uh, wanting to ask Nicole those questions that we undoubtedly missed, because uh, we are distracted by tiles in our car and four-year-olds, um, please join the community at community.wealthwithoutwallstreet.com. You can join today and be asking her questions tomorrow. Um, Nicole, thank you for being a part of that and, um, and for being willing to do that. Thank you so much. Excited to do that. Have you been listening to our podcast and wondering, am I the only person that knows about infinite banking? Or what about the five pillars of Wealth Without Wall Street? How can I learn more? Now is your chance. You can join the community that is learning this across the country. Go to community.wealthwithoutwallstreet.com where you can access Q&As with all our podcast guests and live group coaching with some of the top experts from across the nation. And yes, I'm throwing in the stallion and I in that. Just go to community.wealthwithoutwallstreet.com and sign up. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.